that. Okay, we are now recording, which, as everyone knows, I do like because it does help. Well, it's a real honour to welcome another vocal composer to the group. Andrew, welcome. Thanks very much for having me. It's really good to be here and uh, great to be able to share with you in this way. Thank you. Um, I've said before that my knowledge of um, Salvation Army songs to music can be measured like that. And we all have our favourites, but I'm really keen to learn the differences between brass and vocal and also the likes and dislikes and we kind of have a thing in Salvation Army Songs to Brigades where you do the performance piece or you do the let's get the congregation knowing this piece but um from you I mean I know the name and I'm familiar with you as a, a Salvationist as a person now, I know you're from Sunderland um but that's it so background what's your musical heritage is there any I don't know Yes, so I'm from a very musical family, and in terms of the Salvation Army, I'm a fifth generation Salvationist, Ooh, and, a, and a and a fourth generation Salvation Army music leader. So, so there's quite a substantial heritage there in terms of the army, in terms of music. And um, began piano lessons at a very early age. Um, began playing the piano very early, but then in terms of my lessons, around about the age of six. Um, and so I've had piano lessons from the age of six and started to learn to play the trombone in the Young People's Band. Mm -hmm. Progressed from there on in, really active at school as a student. I then went on to study music at Durham University, which was a really um, enriching experience for me. And then subsequent to that, I've gone on to train to be a teacher. And currently uh, I'm head of music in a Catholic school in South Shields, which is uh, famous for being where George Marshall spent oh, a lot of his really? time yeah. as, as a barmaster. And um, there's a lovely hymn tune uh, written by George Marshall uh, called South Shields. And then as of September, uh, I'm moving up, as it were, and uh, will be assuming the role of assistant head teacher. So that'll be a, a very interesting uh, new experience for me. But music's been a big part of my life. It's uh, what I do for a job. Um, it's what I do in my social time. It's also what I do as part of my worship. So it's a really big part of my life. That's interesting. I mean, as you say, um, you come from a really musical historical um part of the army and marshall is just legendary anyway but as a someone growing up in the army and being involved in the section was that a hindrance or was that something that as a, a core and a, you know as someone that you know the core down the road you were proud of to have that tradition with south shields and the, the time and that kind of area yeah i think yeah, I think so many years down the line, because George Marshall was promoted to glory back in 1956. So that's a long time ago, isn't it? Yeah. Um, even though that's quite a few years ago, there's still quite a, an, an association and um, a real link there. And people do still speak very fondly of George Marshall and of his marches. And uh, from my own experience, excuse me, uh, marches such as Mighty to Save, uh, The Liberator, you know, they've still played quite regularly and people will still, you know, associate the area with um, George Marshall and thinking about also songs such as Grant Us Thy Peace mm -hmm. um, is, is a great one. We had the uh, staff songsters at Millfield um, just in February and they sang um, Grant Us Thy Peace as a tribute to George Marshall because they were in the area. So although he was promoted to glory many, many years ago, there is still a, a real kind of association with him and the core in, in the Northeast. Yeah. Um, I, if I remember correctly, I was doing a little bit of. Uh, I think you're one of three Sunderland cores. You're Milford, I think there's a Sunderland yes. And of course, you've got Monk Wearmouth. Yeah, the, there that, are three. The other side of the country, let's say. Yeah, so the, the, there are three cores. There's uh, Sunderland Millfield, yeah. which is where I am, and I'm the uh, songs to leader there and have been for the last six and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, there's Sunderland Monk Wearmouth, which is just down the road, and likewise another core, Sunderland Citadel. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the three core, there's also a life house uh, mm -hmm. called Swan Lodge, and yeah. there's also a community project uh, in a in a 
suburb called Southwick. So it's the Southwick Community Project. So all in all, there's five expressions of the Salvation Army within the city of Sunderland. Uh, it's a very sort of um, dominating force. It's very welcome. And so, um, so you say you come from a musical family. So when did you sort of find out that you had this ability to put notes on paper in an order that other people could use? I mean, you came from a musical family and fifth generation and all that, but when was the first time you remember sort of manuscript paper being around and having a go? And Yeah, um, so the, the piano's always been in the house and the piano was where it started for me in terms of composing. And that would just see me playing around on the piano. Um, I would use the term messing around, you know, just, just kind of trying to make up little tunes, maybe doing little arrangements of choruses to play during the offering. Um, I was very fortunate from an early age to have a lot of opportunities to to do things um, in the core, to be able to play the piano for, for congregational singing, to play for the singing company. But in terms of the, the compositional aspect, it would be really around my kind of early teens where I started to, to play, you know, my own little arrangements on the piano, which would be used for things such as the offering, or maybe I was asked to play a solo and I'd do a little arrangement of, of a chorus. So really it was playing the piano, which then led to me writing down things on, on manuscript paper. And so when you discovered that this was something that you could do, you know, outside of a fun, but as a serious kind of occupation that could be studied at a higher level than just holiday jottings in the back of the car. Um, were, were there any kind of people that sort of helped you, mentors that, guided you in your process and helped strengthen the sort of the tips and tricks of tidying and the grammar if you like were there, who are the names that spring to mind for you yeah absolutely i mean i've been very fortunate to have a lot of very good role models and um people who have taken great interest both within the salvation army and outside of the salvation army as well in terms of within the salvation army uh, when things started to get you know a little bit more serious people like Andrew Blythe he was mm -hmm. he was being a big encourager of me and uh, been very generous in terms of his time and his interest in what I've done I'm um, thinking of outside of the Salvation Army a brass band name is Ray Farr a very famous conductor yeah. who used to conduct Grime Thorpe and and other groups um, over the years he's currently living in in Norway now and doing a lot of conducting out there and so he grew up in the Salvation Army and he, and he, I mean, he was very good when I was at university in terms of, you know, looking at um, my music, giving me um, sort of guidance from, from a professional standpoint. So, so he's getting music regularly published in the professional world, if you like. Mm -hmm. And then also when I was at school, um, I had two very good music teachers. I'll name them, um, Stephen Pettit mm -hmm. and uh, Philip Sanderson. They were two really good uh, influential teachers you know nothing to do with the Salvation Army but but church no, uh, goers yeah. um, so they were sympathetic to my background and uh, were very interested when you know my GCSE co composition was variations on praise my soul the king of heaven that was you know um, so 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 there we go um, so I've, I've had a lot of of, of encouragers and uh, they are a few of the names in addition to family who've been very um good from a from a kind of oral perspective of listening to things saying you know why don't you try this why don't you try that my dad's a a, a good pianist as well and he has um you know encouraged me to use maybe more um uh, interesting chords and things like that so there's been a lot of people who who have encouraged and have guided along the way interesting so um as you say you, you you've done this from an early age and the order of um writing is not necessarily reflected in the order of publication hmm. so when was the can you remember the first time that you had a piece whether it was i, I would guess vocal although you can prove me wrong i i don't know this is what part of the, the wonder of this conversation was outside of the four walls of the family home and the piano you had something who was the first group that sort of had a first crack at a, a mere composition yeah that, that that's an interesting converse um interesting question Get, get, get my teeth back in there um but oh, I go to the club. for me yeah for me i um had stuff performed in school concerts um again being very uh, active at school as a student um in terms of the the core um there were a few occasions where i'd actually written um a piece for me to play but with say a brass quartet and yeah. um, to, to to accompany me mm -hmm. um i was a big uh, fan, I still am a very big fan um, of, of Richard Phillips and, mm -hmm. and his 
um, musical pursuits, but thinking specifically of kind of the 1990s when he did a lot of CDs. Yeah. Um, and so I'm growing up, uh, you know, as a, as a kid in the 90s, um, and listening to these CDs which he produced, and they, you know, they would have some brass coming in and 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 contributing to these these various arrangements at various points. And um, there was an arrangement of the Christmas Carol in the bleak midwinter, which I did for piano solo with brass uh, accompaniment. That really sticks out one year at a Christmas concert. Um, and so there was a lot of like little things like that. But in terms of the kind of when things took off, if you like, it would have been the uh, the girls chorus at the Territorial Music School. And they um, sung a song entitled Someone Cares. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, using John Gowan's yeah. uh, lyrics. And um, obviously I put a new tune to that. Ooh. And the, the story behind that was uh, quite remarkable in that I'd written this piece um over the course of a weekend and i sent that in to, to andrew blythe just to get some comments as you do um not expecting for anything much to happen to it but maybe just to get a bit of feedback a few pointers here and there mm -hmm. um favorable comments um he said that i like this um sue his wife was conducting the the girls chorus sue had already picked all the music for this year um, but she'd be really pleased to use it next year you know, so, you know, well done and, and just watch this space. So the week went by. I then get a text message the week after, which is the week of Territorial Music School, saying that the other conductor of the group, who was Derek Kane, um, has used um, this piece in rehearsals and they're going to sing it at the Wednesday Festival. Wow. So they sang at the Wednesday Festival and somebody recorded it. Uh, it was Ruth Marklu, who uh, is the Deputy Songs Leader at Concert. She um, recorded that very kindly for me and sent it across. And then I got a message the next day on the Thursday. So, by the way, it's going to be performed again on the Saturday Festival. Uh, do you think you could make it? And so within about a week and a half, this song went from just kind of being me messing around on the piano to being kind of the song of the of the TMS Girls Chorus back in 2011, 2010, something like that. So, yeah, I mean, there's been lots of groups, um, you know, who have been very kind of featuring my music and have also encouraged me kind of in years gone by, which has then seen me have that encouragement, if you like, and that inspiration to keep going and to, to do more. Yeah, I find it very interesting. I mean, from a Garrison Larson point of view, it, it's, I suppose you can get the, um, the tendency to say, that it's very common to get a Charles Wesley or a Fanny Crosby lyric and create a completely different tune. I mean, yeah. how many, you know, how many tunes do we sing to? How many different songs? But well, I'll tell you, a, I'll tell you an interesting story about that one because subsequent to that, it got published um, as a songs to song in the mm -hmm. songs to journals, yeah. and that um, it's not the first Gowans and Larson rewrite, but I believe it is the first one that's been published and that there was uh, quite a discussion, I think, at the Music Council as to whether, um, you know, is this okay for us to, um, you know, to be looking into rewriting songs from the musicals, because obviously the musicals have kind of had their day, I suppose, in some regards, as musicals. The songs live on, and the songs are still sung quite extensively in, in worship, but rewrites, you know, um, somebody of, for example, say, Andrew Bly's generation, um, you know, said they wouldn't have done that because the musicals were still very much a thing back when yeah. he was, you know, my age at the time of writing that song. Um, but uh, a good friend of mine, and who's the um, the, the bandmaster at the call, Andrew Maycock, he also yeah. wrote the song Everywhere. Everywhere, using, yeah, I couldn't think of the yeah. name. So, so he he did wrote that song actually for the TMS Girls Chorus. I think probably about two years before I did Someone Cares. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's other people, um, Gavin Whitehouse across in the US Eastern yep. Territory, um, Andrew Wicker down in Swindon, they've also done, he's, he's done a rewrite of a, of a Gowns and Larson song. Um, and so it's been quite a common thing where people have taken the, these um, mm -hmm. songs and put new, new tunes to them. Uh, but Someone Cares, my one was the first one which has been published as, as a rewrite. It wasn't the first rewrite, but it was the first one to be published. And I know that they ran it by um, General Larson um, and it was um, Commissioner Gowans. Um, I think at that time, General Gowans was, was quite unwell. Um, but the, that certainly my song was was bounced off them to ensure that they were happy with it being mm -hmm. being published. And what did they think of that? And it got their blessing and ended up in print. I, I think that's really wonderful because I think you, we do get this kind of polar vision 
thing where you get a song and you can't touch that, that's sacrilege, you know, that was done by an army great. And I mean, I've relayed before that I've had conversations with other denominations and said that if you sang Oh mm -hmm. Jesus, I Have Promised outside of the army, they'd sing it to a completely different tune. And I remember saying to a, a Catholic friend, she said, oh yes, you sing it to Aurelia. Don't think I've ever sang it to that. And you produce everywhere, and someone might say, I said, do you know what? There's a different tune to that. I mean, Stanley yeah. Dittman's I'm in his hands. Another classic example, Driven New Life. So, you know, and it's been good. It, it's been good to, to kind of see um, this become quite a trend in recent times. Um, and as you've pointed out there, the I'm in his hands uh, setting, which has become very popular as well. And I think it's good because it gives the words a new lease of life. Um, it does also ensure that the message lives on because you know music moves on and the trends move on you know we mentioned um george marshall and he writes you know some fantastic choral music but it's music of a bygone era in many regards you yeah, know it's beautiful it's stuff yeah. but it means that obviously the rewrites help that message and ensure that 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 it remains and those lyrics are still there for people to to enjoy and be blessed by yeah um so looking at your music uh because vocal is something i don't know about i can ask you these questions what is the balance of people coming to you with lyrics like I, the Rob Little and Keith Banks and saying, look, I've written some lyrics. Can you set it to it? As opposed to someone saying, right, we've got this territorial music school, we've got this Congress, we, we're going to have a mass chorus of 500 girls, we need something bouncy or we need devotional. For you, what's the balance? Which is the more common? So just have a it's lyric about, coming? It's about 50-50. Um, I would say, um, certainly, um, I tend to write now when I'm asked to do things and, and generally this time of year, I'd be preparing at least three or four pieces for various music schools. Yep. Obviously there are no music schools this year. <laughs> um, and so my, uh, my it's creative tragedy, output tragedy. has to be, um, directed elsewhere, but it's about 50, 50. Um, it may be the case that I get in contact with them with an idea. Um, it may well be that they get in contact with me with an idea and certainly in terms of my output and also some of the songs which have been published as well um, it has been the case that the music has actually come first mm -hmm. um, and so it's not always necessarily the lyrics that come first but people like as you mentioned Rob Little and Keith Banks you know very very established uh, lyricists uh, within the Salvation Army have given me a lot of time and a lot of encouragement and um, it's been a real joy to work with them and it's good to to collaborate with people and what what happened with me as i've mentioned to you you know one of the first ones was someone cares from the songbook and if the, my first few songs were just songbook rewrites essentially and i would pick up the book and just open it and as soon as i found something that i liked i would just um put some music to it and then it was andrew blythe who said it would be good for you to collaborate with somebody and to look at some brand new words because the army needs new lyrics just as much as it needs new music mm -hmm. and uh, why don't you get in, in touch with um or i'll put you in touch with uh, with with rob little and um you can write a song together and that's how that all started in terms of collaborating and then we then came up with a song called the mask which yep. has also been published in the sing to the lord yep. and that was for a uh, territorial music school the year after someone cares so in terms of the you know lyricists and you know requests it's very much a 50 50 thing quite often people will say i've got some lyrics would you like to put some music to it then again it might be a request and i'll then contact somebody who i want to work with and um, and we'll get something up and running and that may well be that i've already started to sketch out some sort of an idea mm. uh, for the type of song that i'm looking to create do you ever get the danger of um when you've you've got a set of lyrics and you've got to create the music to it. How do you clean your musical palette? Because as I've said before, we get 24 seven music with Spotify, YouTube, the radio, our personal MP3 players or whatever. Um, music is not something that you have to go to the church hall or to the festival hall to listen to. You've got it in your car, but you've got to approach this and say, I've got to do the mayor version for the bank's lyrics without making sure that I'm copying you know, Elvis Costello or doing a, a Presley rewrite of a Mayor rewrite. 
how, how do you keep yourself fresh? How do you lock yourself off to make sure that you're not unintentionally copying or duplicating or hang on that harmony was on the radio this morning. That's the, the advertising jingle for the weather. I hear it nine times a yeah. day, you know, mm -hmm. how do you keep it fresh? It's a good question that I'm glad about that. <laughs> it's not a, it's a good question because it's quite a, quite a tricky one, I suppose, and it'll differ from individual to, to individual. Um, but for me, again, it goes back to, to sitting at the piano. Um, there have been occasions where I've written something, I thought that sounds really good. And then someone said, oh, by the way, that's a few bars from whatever song, mm -hmm. you know, or yeah. that's a, a, an Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, motif, for example. And so, yeah, I mean, for me, it's very much about being at the piano it's about experimenting. It's about what kind of sounds right, what feels right. Um, and, you know, it's about taking that time just to be focused on that task at that time. Mm -hmm. um, there was one song which I did, I think the initial idea came during uh, waiting in the queue at KFC drive through or something like that. So there have been occasions where I've been, you know, in, in, in weird and wonderful places and a little idea just came into my head. But in terms of Does how do the I smart do phone come out and lots of audio? Yeah, recording? it it absolutely a lot of voice memos. But in terms of how do I actually approach it and how do I kind of mm -hmm. like you know clear my head? Uh, it would be you know everything's done at the piano, and it's you know looking at you know when you're looking at lyrics, it's you establish what the kind of the meter is, so what the time signature is. Yeah. Um. You know you then establish. Um. You know is it a happy song? Is it a sad song? So is it going to be major? Is it going to be minor? Mm -hmm. uh, or is it going to be a bit of both? Um, you, you then look at things like, you know, tempo. Is this song crying out, you know, that it's a, a celebration and it should be a very bright song or, or is it quite a devotional one? Um, and all this stuff is, is, you know, five or ten minutes just literally just playing on the piano, working out some chords. Oh, that's quite good. You know, that quite works. I like that. And then generally for me, it'll be a laptop just next to me and I'll just input as we go. Um, which means that I can do things pretty pretty quick. But yeah, in terms of how do I get into the zone, it's very much about playing on the piano and experimenting. Um, you're, you're, as you say, a relatively young man, so computer technology has been around for several years. So unlike many composers before you, who wouldn't have had access to the um, firework brand of Finale, Sibelius, insert name here, um, do you do you have a preference for pen and paper or is it piano linked to the computer and then tied um, it up later i've i've never really been a pen and paper um guy because that's just what not it's not what my generation really does um i mean i was talking to somebody the, the other day saying that my kind of primary school um years was really when computers were becoming quite the norm yeah um so by the time i um reached gcse and a levels you know, having a computer for your music lessons was, was quite, it's just what happened, you know, when, when we had Sibelius and I had Sibelius at home uh, on my laptop there. And so it's always been a, a Sibelius exercise, but I suppose where um, I would differ to maybe some of the um, other Sibelius composers of people just bashing things into the computer is that obviously I do at the piano. So it's kind of you know I can I can check as I go so it's not the case of I bash everything into Sibelius and hope for the best you know it's actually I am composing with the instrument and then putting it into the to the computer thereafter but I've never really been a pen and paper guy because it's just not really what my what my generation's kind of I think you're about the first about. person that's admitted to doing it like that that's really interesting because I thought with, with the you know so many composers said that the tendency of Sibelius is that you hear everything perfectly and yeah. it will play it almost as in the Royal Albert Hall style that you have that mm. perfect balance. So is it a case of that when the choir hears it and sings it out loud and that you, you have to kind of re-educate yourself to say, hang on, that, the, the altos don't work quite in real life, although the computer plays it perfectly? There may be the odd tweak here and there. And certainly, for example, at a, at a music school, you know, the, there may well be a few alterations made, um, you know, as, as the week progresses. But it, it tends to be all right because then I'll print it off and then I generally play through the piano again. I'll generally kind of play or sing through some of the, the vocal lines. And I think just having that consideration of knowing who I'm writing for and, 
knowing their, if you like, their 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 limitations or knowing their uh, their strengths as well mm-hmm. enables that to be quite quite bespoke. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I know of composers like um, Ken Downey, who's obviously you know one of the the top dogs, as it were, mm-hmm. uh, within Absolutely. within within the Salvation Army and and indeed the brass oh, band yeah, just music world. Just, yeah. Um, and I, and I did get in contact with Ken a number of years ago now because Ken also studied music at, at Durham University, so that's my my one and only little link uh, to him. Um, but uh, he wrote a lovely arrangement um, of the song "In the Love of Jesus," mm-hmm. the tune Hammond, and it's a really good um, brass um, band piece which is published in, in the Army Journals, maybe General Series, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, I got in contact because I knew that Ken. Uh, writes um everything out you know by by hand and has all these short scores and asked if you'd send me it and he actually sent me the the short score for that particular piece and to see how people like him you know write you know and and the consideration is just tremendous series 2010 that's the one that's the one and so and so uh for me you know i think it's very much a generational thing that pen and paper was never really how you did it at school pen and paper was never really how I was taught and so I've just kind of kept going and even at university you know working alongside somebody like Ray Farr again you know he wasn't a really big pen and paper man from what I saw anyway um but obviously gave just as much consideration as what kind of Ken Downey did in terms of you know scoring out on three staves and then taking the full brass band and all this sort of stuff Mm -hmm. so I do think it's very much a generational thing interesting yeah um are you do you prefer doing the vocal side of it rather than the brass side? I mean, as you you've done brass quintets, but um, yeah, so apart from I think I think there's one march in the unity that mm-hmm. has been published. I mean, obviously there's boxes of stuff in the that are unpublished that haven't just sort of sprouted wings and haven't been sent in yet. But um what's your do you have a preference or is it just a case of what comes naturally and what the time is there for to do? Um it's much for, much quicker for me to do vocal. Um, for me, it's a quick process. Being a, a pretty competent pianist, to to literally just just play and and that's it. That's it done. I can churn out a song quite quick. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some songs which have been written very very quickly, um, and you know I I can do that quite quite easily in some regards. Mm-hmm. Brass is a completely different beast altogether, and I have had one uh, piece published in Unity series last year or the year before. Um, a march called Seize the Day. Yeah, I was listening to it earlier. Um, and that just happened by accident, really. I mean, I didn't really intend on writing that at all. It was just, again, messing around one day. And I spent one summer across in, uh, well, I spent two summers across in the USA, and I attended the Western Music Institute, which is oh, the really? TMS yes. of the yes. um, USA Western Territory. Yeah. And uh, one of the guys I met there uh, amongst many, you know, really <laughs> the whole liturgy of being right there. Yeah, was uh, it was Kevin Larson. Oh, Kevin, and the other um, guy. and I, um, Kevin also plays trombone, and we sat next to each other for for the whole week in the uh, the WMI band, mm-hmm. and uh, it was just really nice just to talk to him and to to learn a little bit about uh, his work and, and what he's been doing, and we played a march of his called Temple One Two Five. Yes. Which is, uh, which is quite a popular one across here. Yeah. And we played that for the Timbrels. And I think I said something like, you know, how long did it take you to write that? He said, well, it didn't take too long because if you think about it, you know, with a the march, there's a certain formula, you know, it's A, B, C, and then you do a little bit, you repeat this section and then you do a little bit of that and then you just finish it off sort of thing. Yeah. And so when I was messing around one day on the piano, I thought, I think I'm onto something here. Should I just give it a go? And with Unity Series, you know, being great in that there's not as many parts, yeah. And obviously a lot of the parts are doubled, you know, at the second corner, it's the same as the first horn. I'll take um, word for it. I'm, yeah. I'm the um, one. I just do what the drum tells me. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of parts which, which are which are the same. So you're in effect writing five parts. Yeah. I thought this could be quite a, an interesting little exercise. And so again, I think it took me about two days to do, uh, all really? in all. It's yeah. A very so functional I, piece. Yeah, well, surprisingly so. And um, and so I sent that in to 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 Andrew. Again, you know, just wondering what 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 will come of this, and I think that the, there was a little bit of feedback just to tweak a few bits here and there, um, yeah. but on the whole, it it worked quite well, and we could we could take this one forward, and that was the first brass piece I I um, submitted. Um, subsequent to that, I've submitted either one or two 
um, songs for the or song arrangements for the scripture based journal. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so they're they're somewhere in the system at the moment. But as of yet, there's no more brass on the cards uh, purely because it's not really my natural natural habitat. You know, vocal is much quicker uh, for me. Also, being a songster leader. Um, it's been, you know, it's good to to write things for, for my own group and then just kind of take them along one night and give it a whirl. Um, I also play the piano for the girls' chorus at our divisional summer school, so there's a lot of stuff there which is written for them. So a lot of the things that I write vocally is, is for groups which I'm involved with. So it, it's a case of time and accessibility because, I mean, if you if you know that I said, look, I've got to do something for the divisional youth band, then you do it. But because you're involved you know the immediate thing is you've got the girls course you've got the songs brigade you've got the, the various you know vocal accessibility the need is more kind of i can do this and know that the end product is um more durable and i also in a sense you know who you're writing for and what their strengths mm. are i mean you don't just want to write a piece of music that no one can sing or goes oh that was a clunk and just gathers dust yeah you know, you've got there, there is a there's a mind. song absolutely um, and you've got to obviously, you know, think about if you if it wants to have a bit of longevity and wants to be published, it's got to fit within the the box if you like. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to make sure that you're kind of ticking off the criteria as as you go as to what you know they will be looking for at music editorial to, you know, make this piece functional for for the army uh, journals. Mm -hmm. Now there is a piece which I did with Commissioner Keith Banks for the Amsterdam Staff Songsters, and mm -hmm. I was asked to do that for the Bangladesh Congress back yep. in 2015 yep. and yep. um they did a cd and they did a little tour like a week or so before the congress and so it was well well featured it's a song called the way to worship now because that was for the um amsterdam staff songsters who i've got a very good uh, rapport with um because of you know knowing the the capabilities of the group um knowing the occasion that it was yeah. for it was quite a, a, a showstopper. I think it lasted about maybe six and a half minutes and it was three movements, kind of a fast oh. movement, a slow movement, and, and then a fast one to finish with. Like very very tricky. Show. Well, yeah, I mean, like, you know, you think about the, the three piece suites <laughs> that used to have, you know, for the, uh, for the bands back mm -hmm. in the day, you know. It was a bit like that and I, I thought we'd, we'd be a bit more adventurous and we could, could go for it and, and it had a tricky piano part. Um, it had quite high notes in places for you know the ladies and for the gentlemen and it was a tricky piece but that was for that particular group but we know that that wouldn't end up in the journals because one it's too long uh, there's too many bars um and secondly um it's too complex you know it, it wouldn't get you know used by a lot of groups it would get used by some groups mm -hmm. and uh, we've certainly had a look at some of it at millfield um, Govan, which is the core um, Keith Bank soldiers at. Yep. He's the um, executive officer of the songsters there, and so they they use uh, his stuff. And then oh, they've they've had it, um, and and um, I can't remember if they either have or they're going to be looking looking at it. And so you know there are some groups who who could tackle it, but it's it it wouldn't um, fit the criteria for the journal. So just going back to what you're saying about you've got to know your audience, and yes, yeah. you can show off a bit, and you can be a bit more complex and for some groups but you've got to be mindful of if you want it to be published it's got to hit a certain criteria um does the publishing um is that kind of a um a bonus to it because if someone comes to and says look i'd like to set this lyrics to music you're you're sort of answering a need and it's a great case of you know what if this turns out we'll give it to the local songs brigade and it'll have a bash at it and mm. you're, not, you're not necessarily saying, okay, this is definitely going to be a, an epic Royal Albert Hall piece for the mass songsters. It's going to be for the songs brigade down the road who may only have a dozen singers. Yeah. So mm. you, 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 presumably you have that functionality where the, the reality is that, yes, you can write for the best of the best of the idiot and you know that anything you write, basically they'll have a stab at. Mm. But you've also got a, you know, the, the, almost like the day-to-day -day issue of, then we need a Sunday night thing for a concert and it's only got 12 people. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, that's a really valid point. And as a songs leader myself, I know um, that, you know, certain songs suit certain occasions. And, you know, sometimes from a compositional aspect and as a teacher, you often tell students that less is more. Yep. And that is something which I've, you know, 
came to know myself that you know sometimes less is more sometimes less is more effective yes it's easier but it doesn't mean it's any lesser of a piece yeah. um but i you know i think that within the salvation army i think that the the numbers and groups and you know the the capabilities for what of a better word of groups um does vary considerably you know yeah. and that's not me kind of saying that people's worship is better than the other you know whatever i'm not saying that, yeah. that. Yeah, um a, but i'm just real, just put yeah it's a real day-to-day yeah, -day -day issue isn't it absolutely so yes you've got to make sure that you are um writing so that people can access the music and that it can be used by a lot of groups and i think that is the the primary function you know of of the the editorial department of ensuring that you know that groups are resourced and so therefore there has to be due consideration given you know for the many uh, not the few to use that turn of phrase but yeah i'm very conscious of the fact um as a leader that you know there are times where i need a certain type of song and maybe yes i then do a quick arrangement um or you know look through the sync to the lord and say oh yes you know there's that perfect piece of a couple of verses a couple of choruses that'll do the trick but but yeah you've you've, you've got to give due consideration uh, for me you know it is a bonus if it gets published it's not the be all and end all when i was younger um you know it was like oh yeah i want to get, get get songs published and get as many songs as i can now you know it's it's a it's a privilege to get things published and if it gets published it gets published if not then then other people use it and i've got a good um list of contacts of people who i know uh, will use my music you know if, okay. if i send them that's all right in saying that you know we need something for next week but you know we haven't got a million pounds in the bank to pay you to do it you know have you got anything on the scrap of paper that you can uh, do for us um going from being a performer to a conductor when was the first time you can remember being said you wrote it you conduct it um as a conductor my my first my first appointment if you like um my first commission um would have been as the assistant yp band leader at the age of 16 um, I then subsequently became the YP band leader um, and then I moved across, became deputy songster leader and then songster leader after that. And and so I suppose it'd been my, my late teens um, that that started to be the case um, where I was given the opportunity to conduct things. Um, but it would really be the last four or five years that uh, it was quite a regular occurrence that, that I'd be asked to conduct things because i'd written them yeah. um i was invited up to govern which of course i should have just mentioned a few moments ago i've mm -hmm. got family up there and, and i was actually invited up there as, as a guest conductor for um a songs to sing company weekend which they they've, they've done regularly over the years and the idea there was that i was a conductor i was a guest piano soloist and they also featured my music and so yeah i mean it it happens from time from time to time um, but really, it would be the late teens that that the conducting started. Have you ever been surprised by uh, a performance of your own piece, where, as you as you say, Sam Creamer was just resting in the back, and people sort of say they don't even realise you're there, and a piece of music, and you're like, oh my goodness, and they kind of don't even realise you're in the congregation, and it's sort of taking your breath away. And um, that there have been a, a few performances. Um, I don't think they've ever not known I was there. Um, but if, for example, I've mentioned the ISS were at Millfield back in February and they did a rendition of a song called Just Where He Needs Me, which mm -hmm. is one which is published. Yep. Um, that was really good. That was Sunday morning, just after the sermon. A really good sermon. A uh, lot, of, lot of things to think about. And they then sung this. And, you know, obviously, you know, it's going to be good. You know, it's the Staff Songsters. Yes. But the but but that was um but that was really special. Likewise, here in the Amsterdam staff singing um at the O2, that was a real thrill, a real highlight as well. But it's always a it's always good to hear your music. It always gives you a bit of a buzz. Mm -hmm. It always makes the hours worthwhile um, to actually hear it and to see people's kind of expressions on their faces and that they're really enjoying it. So hearing your music perform live is is a real. Uh, privilege and it does make it all worthwhile and gives you that incentive to keep going yeah 
I mean, as you say, once it's published, it's out there and, you know, the, the safety catches off. And one of the questions that's become one of my favourites to ask, because the results have been really interesting, was when was the last time you had a text message or an email or a postcard or a message from someone saying, we played, we sang such and such a piece? And you're like, where? Like, how did that get there? I never would have thought of my music being played. I mean... I think South Korea, yeah. Romania. What's the most unusual it, place you've heard of yourself? India. India. Interesting. Yeah. So um, there's there's a, a family who who go to the core, a millfield, um, who originate from India, and I've been in contact uh, with uh, the Songs Brigade of the core, which they originate from, and I know that in India they've got like a because in India I think there's about four or five territories because it's such a obviously such a vast last yeah. country yeah. um and that for one of the territories or maybe more of them there is like a territorial songsters and i've certainly seen them sing um uh, mm -hmm. something of my i can't remember what it was but i remember being tagged in something on facebook and it was like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Te territorial group in, in india singing whatever so yeah so that, that, that's interesting it just proves that the music does travel i know that the in the netherlands and holland that they've got a, an arrangement whereby they can translate the music and uh, translate the words into yeah. their own language um, and so i know that uh, there's been songs that have been translated into dutch and used across there but you know obviously you think about places like canada usa um, australia new zealand mm -hmm. i mean the sing to the lord is really the um the premier vocal publication if you like for the salvation army worldwide other territories do publish um, their own music um, oh, yeah. and there are some other singing journals but really the sing to the lord is is the one and that's the one which you know people from abroad will will buy into as well as well as maybe purchasing the ones from their own territory i think it's interesting because really in the last couple of years the availability to put not be restricted to buying army music from your own territorial music department has meant yeah. that, you know we can buy maple leaf stuff arthur gullage stuff yeah and of course that applies yeah. to other territories hang on a minute who's this everywhere who's this someone cares what you know what's the what's the gel on this absolutely i mean there's a there's a song called his promise stands which i wrote with keith banks and that's in sing praise which is usa's southern territory and that's their vocal publication and that's quite a good one and i've used a couple of things uh with the songs is from the sing praise um, that's a an, a three part, so it's soprano, alto, baritone. So it's just like one male uh, vocal line. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting, and, and sometimes they can put either they can, there'd be an optional fourth part or whatever. So that's another uh, vocal publication which I've been a part of myself, mm -hmm. and I've used uh, stuff from. Um, but I yeah, it, 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 where you you've submitted a piece to music, you know, you kind of said no, that doesn't fit it, and then someone else has said. That would be great for our journal we will have that in uh, our country that hasn't happened to me yet um that there have been a couple of songs which have been turned down um by the music council um at uk thq but not on account of the music on both occasions it was on the account of the lyrics okay. uh, because maybe the, the lyrics weren't theologically sound or uh, yeah. one of them it, it, it told the story in in like a different way to what the bible you know, portrayed us and they yeah. felt that it wasn't quite in keeping with, with that verse. So I've actually had two pieces um, turned down, but not on account of the music. It was on account of the lyrics, but I haven't then explored other avenues. I've just kind of said, well, fine, whatever. Um, but yeah, I've not actually been in that position yeah. where other people have taken on after. Yeah. I mean, I, one of the, the, actually the very first um, interview was David Edmonds and he'd done this, I think it was a lovely little swing arrangement and music, I think, they said no thanks and then usa eastern said well we'll have it because if we're not going to let it you know lie on the shelf if yeah. it's useful mm -hmm. take it up so as you said you know there's no kind of boundary as to where your music can be brought up so uh, who are your musical heroes at the moment i mean who are the people that you enjoy listening to within a salvation army context i mean that i'll, I'll apply that to both brass and vocal yeah i, mean, I mentioned previous richard phillips Mm -hmm. um big influencer as a pianist as a conductor as a composer i mean i love his 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 songs he's recently done those choral symphonies 
for the ISS. You know, they're very, very impressive. I actually had lunch with Richard when um, the staff songs were up and it was good to chat to him and to bounce a few things off him. So he's been a big influencer for, for many, many years. Um, Len Ballantyne, he's a great guy. You know, when I've done similar um, kind of Zoom meetings over recent weeks and I've asked people, you know, who's your favourite, you know, Salvation Army choral composer? Everybody said Len Ballantyne. Yeah. Um, just because he's just such a craftsman um, yeah. and he, he's able just to to create just such beautiful music um, you know the music has great um, integrity if, if I can put it like that yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. you know his music has great integrity you know he also writes lyrics as well and uh, his songs are always very popular and so he's also been a big a big influencer as well so I would say Richard Phillips and then Ballantyne are, are my, my two um, big army sort of influences from a, from a compositional perspective um, what about just as a, um, enjoying the music, not as a performer or uh, you know, their technical ability, but if a, mu- you know, if a piece of music comes on the stand, I mean, the Ray Stemmel, Alan Ken Downey, and as you say, Len Ballantyne have all been heavily mixed. But, you know, if you're, you know, if you're in a, a mass song or you're taking the back seat and someone brings out an old Gems or something, and you, the name's like, oh, wow, I haven't sung that for a while. Are there any yeah. kind of historical names that kind of give you a ping and sort of say, do you know what? Yeah, I remember that guy being good. Yeah, I mean, I mean I've mentioned George Marshall a few times. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> a, I mean a, a George Marshall uh, song always goes down well. Uh, things like Jesus himself drew near, yeah. uh, grant us thy peace, my treasure, the greatest of these. You know, absolute, like, beautiful music. You know, absolutely beautiful stuff. I mean, likewise, Leslie Condon. You know, I used um, the the song, um, a song of praise. praise. Eternal God. Yeah. Um, we did that when the songs went to Norwich Citadel a couple of years ago, and that's a that's a great Ooh, song. That's in, my, know, that's in my local <laughs> Norwich. That's yeah, a few miles up the road from me. Uh, and that, that that was a good one. P- people liked singing that. You know, it, it's a good strong melody. Um, you know, great great sing. You can have a really good good sing on that one. Um, so, you know, looking to the past, you know, people like George Marshall, Leslie Condon, uh, you know, really good, solid writers. Yeah. It's interesting with the song of prose because I, I can't remember for the life of you who said it, and I apologise to them because you interview so many people. They said they, they sang it somewhere and the core hadn't, they just didn't know it. And, mm. I, you know, it's not an easy piece to sing a song of prose. I mean, my father asked me a while ago, he was doing a, a morning meeting at Woodbridge where we sold you. And he said, look, he said, what do you, we need something to finish the meeting off with. I said, why don't we use a song of praise, Eternal God. We've got a few retired songsters and they'll give it just what I completely forgot was that verse three and four go off on a completely different thing. And half the yeah. congregation were going, what's going on here? And yeah. I just forgot. I just remembered it being just a really passionate Catherine Bear, I think, done the lyrics. And of course, Les done it for... <laughs> Centenary it was for the centenary, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but that's a great one. But yeah, it's it's one of the better, my favourites. But as I mean, everyone I mean, who watches mentioned... the series will know, I am a massive Leslie Condon fan. So yeah, Dot, Dot, Dot will definitely back me up on that. Um, so when you're not composing, obviously you're a school teacher, you're a family man, you've got core commitments. What do you do outside of knocking out another Keith Banks masterpiece and a Rob Little masterpiece? You know, what else is in? You know. Walking the dogs, painting, you know, sculpting, you know, what else is in the field? Um, I also direct musicals. Um, so I, I really enjoy doing that um, in local uh, theatres for local amateur, drama, amateur dramatics groups. No. Um, and so I've, I've directed a, a good few musicals over the last few years. I really enjoy that. It's a, it's a really good thing to do um, outside of the army, if you like. Um, but in terms of outside of music as a whole, um, I'm a keen um, cyclist and I uh, go out on the bike quite a lot and, and I do enjoy that. Um, You've got the perfect venue the for it out there. Yeah, well now <laughs> the weather's getting a bit better and obviously with the lockdown change and uh, I've been going to the golf driving range as well. I used to be a very keen golfer when I was young and so I'm looking to get back into that as well. So I do, When do you were little... young, you're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I say when I was young, when, when I was 10, I joined the golf club. Um, that's teen. So, so, so there we go. My granddad got me signed up, and uh, and that was me away. But I haven't played golf properly in years. So I would like to get back back into that. Yeah. 
Um, do you have a favourite Salvation Army song at the moment? Because everyone seems to change every other day, and some said, you know, it's always been that song. So, you know, if if you had to put down a favourite at the moment, what would it be? Yeah, if I had to put one on down right now, it would be um, the Yvonne Field song, Lord of Your Presence. Oh, yeah. Um, I, think, I think it's a great song. And as you say, quite rightly, people, you know, go through different seasons in life and their, you know, favourites change, you know, and, and the new music comes along and they hear a song and then all of a sudden that becomes the favourite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that, 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 that that's, a, that's a great one. It's a good one from a songster perspective, but it's also become very congregational. And I'd say it's now more a congregational song than it is a songster song. Yeah. And I know particularly if it's ever used in a congregational setting uh, within our core, it's always sung with, with great um, affirmation. And, and personally, I think it's a, it's a great song, lovely melody, um, yeah. you know, very well constructed music, you know, musically sound, but a great message in terms of the lyrics yeah. as well. It was one of the pleasures when Yvonne agreed to be interviewed. I was able to ask her about the story. I said, because, you know, we all know the, the famous lyric about, you know, you will go, you know, we'll gird on the arm and God will send, you know, you will not be sent out without the appropriate mm. equipment. And the fact, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, since when will you send us out without being fully equipped for the fight? And as she said, it's all scripture based, which is where the best ideas come from. So, um, before I ask you for your favourite scriptural quote, what else is in the pipeline? Has this lockdown engaged the compositional uh, technique a bit more, or has it kind of said time has been pressing and other evolvements have had to take more precedence? Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's a little bit of both. And uh, there's been times where I've had been felt quite creative, and there's times where I've been felt felt quite lazy in terms of the uh, the the musical output and the musical engagement. Um, for me, I'm very interested in um, looking into collaborating with other writers, uh, potentially, you know, writing with other composers, which sounds quite interesting, I suppose, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, could, could we actually collaborate and, and write a song together? That's not unheard of within the pop world. Um, you know, is that something which we could do? You know, I, like yourself, I've touched base with a lot of different people over the course of the lockdown. And so there's definitely scope to collaborate with other composers in writing a song or maybe even writing a, a longer a longer song or some description um again you know i use the name george marshall again and um i've been very interested in looking into his music and i've mm -hmm. actually looked at where he's buried during lockdown and um he's buried in a cemetery just two or three minutes away from the school that i currently work in mm -hmm. and so uh, i've taken a bit of interest in into his life and his story his music and it'd be great to look into to look into a way of uh, reinventing some of that so as i said you know it's beautiful music and people could say you know there's a very strong argument to not touch it to leave it as it is it's a mm -hmm. masterpiece yeah. but it's music of a bygone era in many regards and it's music which could be very easily forgotten you know in oh, in, yeah. in the future yeah. and so is there a way of either you know taking crushing it and just giving that yeah that's, that's giving it a more often, contemporary yeah. twist well, think, or is it the case yeah. that i take his lyrics and write and write something new you know like i did with gowans and larson sort of musical stuff but that that's been something that's been on my mind as well um so yeah i mean as i say usually this time of year is for preparing for music schools and that kind of you know incentive isn't there this year uh, but certainly there's little ideas of collaborating with others and perhaps something around the, the music of George Marshall, a reinvention of that is what's kind of edging away at the minute. Interesting. Well, we look, it'd be interesting to see what happens and um, maybe some of the YP companies will be going, it's George Marshall, who, who is he? You know, to resurrect me. I mean, I, I said to Sam that reinventing Gowns and Larson and some of the Sidney Cox stuff was almost unheard of because... I think Sidney Cox is a dying breed in the army. I mean, you've got to be of the gems era and of a certain ilk to really know the story behind the man and rather than just, you know, I want to tell you what the Lord has done. Yeah. And to, you know, also it's, um, it's considering the, the, the language as well. And, you know, some of the, yeah. uh, the language is a little bit old fashioned, uh, you know, these and thou's and mm. thou art and all this sort of, and it's maybe finding a way of also finding a lyricist to, to, to help in, terms of you know making some of these a little bit more modern day 
I know that a few years ago at the, the Symphony Sounds concert that they used an arrangement, um, congregational song arrangement of Andrew Bly's of Rescue the Perishing. And I think Stephen Pearson had taken the lyric and he'd, he'd modernised it ever so slightly. So it, it got rid of the these and the thous and you like and kind of wrote it in more modern day text. So there's, there's, there's a lot of things to, to look into um, and to consider. So, yeah, just see what happens. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I think at Christmas we always get people come to say, "What the heck is an Ebenezer?" Here I read my Ebenezer as the song goes. You know, it's some of those things yeah. we see in Christmas carols, and people go, "Ebenezer Scrooge? What's he doing in a you know to sing glory to God?" And it's completely different. Mm. But um, favorite Bible verse? Do you have a passage of scripture or a verse that sticks in the brain? Um, I've got a few, uh, but if I I'm share surprised. one with you, and uh, you know Proverbs three. Um, verse six in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path I think it's a very short and sweet very to the point yeah lovely. well um it's been really fascinating to uh speak to you and to learn the mechanics behind the vocal side of things and that you know you're you you can do brass but you're very comfortable doing the vocal and we thank yeah. you for that i'm just gonna do a prayer with you and um we'll go from there dear lord the gift of singing, the gift of composition, the gift of raising our voice to the Lord is embedded in scripture. It is a scriptural command. We sing a new song to the Lord. We felt that new and loving touch. We praise you, Lord. Your scripture tells us to do that. And we thank you, Lord, that the composers of the past didn't shy away from that when the brass band was in town, that the vocal was just as important and just as scriptural and I thank you for uh, Andrew, who has really taken that on board, is not afraid to really muddle through and to follow your guiding for his life. And that whether it be for a singing company, whether it be for the Star Songsters or a Grand Gala, that that same love and attention and glory goes to you, Lord. And we thank you that he has accepted this gift and that he's using it in a very powerful and positive way. And we thank you for the positivity of that. We sometimes hear of gifts being abused and used for different things, but he's very keen that the end result is to glorify you, Lord, and that your his faith is very powerful and meaningful and that you're at the centre of all his endeavours and that he's constantly, we thank you that he's constantly trying to think of re uh, bringing the scripture back to life and taking those Sunday school stories and songs that we take for granted and saying, let's freshen this up because the message is still there lord and even though sometimes it's hidden under a layer of dust that it doesn't make it any less relevant and important because at the end of the day lord we're here to glorify you and to bring other people through so i thank you for andrew i thank you for his family his core friends his musical comrades i i thank you for the divisional and territorial guidance i thank you for his own personal mentors and teachers and collaborators who are so happy to ring up and say, I've got some lyrics. Can you work some magic? We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for these people who inspire him and continue to support and help and encourage him as he walks this pathway. We thank you that he is keen to continue following you, Lord, and to continue to branch out to whatever that entails, Lord. It's not just for the 12 part songs brigade. It's not just for the three part harmony in the sing company or for the girls who have just become junior soldiers and they want to, they've written the lyrics, but they need the tune, Lord. That can all happen because of you, Lord. That can all happen because people want to go, I know this Jesus and I want to sing it. I want to shout it. And we have people like Andrew who are so willing to take the time to sit down and vocalise it so people can praise the Lord with their voices and with their hearts and raise that song. So I thank you for his love his dedication his commitment the i thank you that he's able to use this lockdown in an effective manner and to be able to let the creative juices flow and that it hasn't hindered as so many composers feel that they just don't have the time lord but i just ask your blessing on him now lord on his family his friends his core folk and for those people he comes into contact with on social media through the ministry of music musicals and composition and lyricism and that art of poetry which is so integral to it all lord 
I just pray your blessing on him now and I thank you for his time, his dedication and his, his willingness to be part of this project. But to God be the glory, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I will...